Good afternoon. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. It is July 29th, 1998. And this afternoon we are interviewing Mary McCarty Rolke, uh, who is a resident of Natick. And Mary, why don't you tell us before we get into some of the background of growing up in Natick, what was your initial position when you first joined the service? When I first joined, I was a storekeeper. I was in storekeeper school, I should say, from which I graduated. Okay, and was this in the Navy? This was in the Navy, okay. out in Bloomington, Indiana. And I had been there, I went there in September, and this was in February, when we were to graduate. And what year was that? 1943. Now let's back up a little. I, I sort of jumped the gun, I, I apologize. <laughs> but you were brought up in Natick? I was, born and raised. And your maiden name, as I mentioned earlier, was McCarty. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit of background about your family? My dad and mother were both very active in the Legion. In fact, my dad, Ray McCarty, was one of the founders of the Transfer of Flags. And do you want to explain what the Transfer of Flags is in Natick? Well, it started out uh, where one pupil in each grade of the Natick school system, from first grade to high school, would be selected as an outstanding student by the teachers and their peers. And that person would be honored at a transfer flag ceremonies. They were given a flag, and that flag they used at their school. They would raise that every morning and take it down every afternoon. And they would be honored at the assemblies at school. And on Memorial Day, they would march with the Legion. It was really a wonderful program. And where in Natick did you grow up? I was born on Forest Avenue. When I was 10, we moved to Pitt Street. When I was in high school, we moved to Cottage Street. Mm -hmm. And when I went in the service, we were living down here in East Central Street. And what did your father do? Daddy did many things. He worked for the Denison for 26, 27 years. And that's Denison Manufacturing Up in Framingham. Framingham. Yeah. And that, oh, I can't remember what year he left that. He owned a little stationery store over on Pond Street next to Hal Robbins Jewelry Store. And your mom? Mom stayed at home with all of her five little darlings. And where were you in the number five? I was second. My sister Eileen was first. My sister Jean is after me. My sister Anne and then my brother Don. My and, and, and just as a little asterisk, the transfer of flags is still in existence oh, today. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Daddy won the Valley Forge Medal, which my sister Jean has given to uh, what's the name of that place up at the depot where they have all of these souvenirs of the wars? One of the stores up there? It's, um, I can't remember the name of it, but she gave Daddy's medal to them. To showcase? To showcase, yeah. What was Natick like growing up back in the early ages? You know, you could walk downtown in Natick and know every single person you met can't do that anymore. We walked to school. When we moved up to Cottage Street, we walked down here to school. That had to be two miles one way. Never thought a thing about it. Everybody knew everybody else. Everybody came down Saturday night to shop. That's when the Stop and Shop was here. And I think there was an a &P over p over there. There was. It was just a nice, quiet little town. And what made you decide to enter the military? <laughs> I don't think I decided it. I think my mother thought it would be a great idea. Why? Oh, I, I had a hard time uh, keeping a job. If I didn't like it, I just wouldn't go. 
All right, we'd call and say, I'm not going to work there anymore. All right, we'll walk out, something made me mad, and I'd just leave. Now, was this after high school? This after was graduation? after high school. Mm -hmm. And I remember them giving me, uh, my, first of all, I remember my mother saying, I read a wonderful article in the Globe this week. It's about uh, the government wanting women in service. Would you like to do that? And I said, I don't know, what would I do? So we threw that around a while. And my mother kept saying every day after that, gee, I think that'd be a great idea. You'd have a wonderful time. You'd have a chance to travel. So I went to Boston one day and signed up. Had my physical. Had a letter saying they accepted me. And when I would go, which was September 42. And I can remember my family giving me a surprise going away party. And my Uncle Joe, my mother's brother, when I walked in and I was so surprised, I can remember him saying, Mary, old kid, this is one job you can't walk away from. <laughs> <laughs> and it was true, I couldn't. I was a captive. But there were a lot of good things about it. Uh, I can't remember much about the train trip to Indiana. I, I don't even remember how I got to Boston. I know there were a lot of families saying goodbye to people. I don't remember anyone in my family being there. So I don't recall how I got to Boston that day. But we all got on the train, and I think we were on the train two days, if I'm not mistaken. And how old were you at that time? 21. 21. Yeah, just a month short of being 22. And a very young 21. I thought everybody, every woman was as nice as my mother, and that every man was as kind and gentle as my father. And it didn't take me long to realize that was not true. But I met many good people. Um, we went to um, Bloomington, Indiana University from the train station. And at that time, there had been nothing there but men. So imagine our surprise when we got there. And they had given one room to six girls, three bunk beds, one small closet for your clothes, and two drawers in this bureau for each person. And uh, open showers. <laughs> which for a young woman which from Which for a, a little greenhorn like me was totally uh, Breathtaking. They didn't even have any doors on the Johns. But it didn't take them long to remedy that. They did. They had one bathtub on each floor. And I think there were 40 girls on each floor of the four floors in that building. But I guess you get used to anything. And it was only temporary. Was this considered your basic training? Yes. And how long were you there? I was there from September to February. And, and what were you learning? Storekeeper school. Storekeeper. I don't know how much I was learning. One thing stands out, though, in Indiana. That was where Hoagie Carmichael wrote Stardust. And we all used to want to go down and sit in that booth that had his name and the, and the date that he wrote the song. We couldn't leave campus. We weren't allowed to go into the town of Bloomington until we had been there for three months. Then we were allowed to go in. But there wasn't anything there. Corn. Oh, I'll never forget that train ride. Corn on the left, corn on the right. You'd go to sleep at night and see corn. You'd wake up in the morning, and the corn was still there. <laughs> but it was interesting. I don't remember much about the train trip. Um, I don't. I remember sitting looking out the window and saying, don't they have anything else here but corn? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned earlier that it was sort of uh, an eye-opener for you that women were not as thoughtful as your mom and dad. Mm. Did you detect some male chauvinism back then? Oh, lots of it. Mm -hmm. Lots In of it. In Indiana also? Yes, because the people who were there were all male. There were no women officers, they were all men. And uh, you had to learn to salute as you went in and salute as you went out. And 
if you forgot, they would yell at you, and if you didn't pay any attention, they would come and get you and put their hand on their shoulder and take you up to the CO and say, she refused this or refused that. In fact, while I was there, two girls were discharged. One of them for not saluting, which I thought was kind of silly, but that's part of service. You have to learn to be obedient, I guess is the word. And for you who came from a home where mom said maybe this would be good for you because, <laughs> how did you react to the discipline? I guess I was okay. I was never disciplined. I never got any demerits. Maybe that was just plain Irish luck because I don't think I worked very hard at it. I did work hard at trying to be a good storekeeper, but I was never good at math. I don't know why I was sent to storekeeper school. And storekeeping was? Supplies, uniforms, what you would use, uh, depending on where you would go. And you would be trained to run that store? Yeah. Or help to run it? Hmm. After Indiana? Well, it was very interesting. We graduated in February, and about two or three days before we were to graduate, a contingent of officers came from Coast Guard in Connecticut and told us at uh, an assembly that now that we were graduates and the Coast Guard didn't have a school set up as yet, but they were really seriously wanting women in their service. And they came to ask if a small contingent of us would be willing to get discharged from the Navy and go over to the Coast Guard. And several of us did. I think there were 40 in my group, including me. And, and how did others in your group react to that? Well, a lot of them thought we were kind of mean to do it. Oh, you have no loyalty to the Navy. They gave you your training. Why didn't you stay? And, you know, they started calling us hooligan which was the name that they used to call the Coast Guard people. But we didn't pay any attention to that. So you s transferred then from? We were uh, discharged from the Coast Guard. And then we were inducted into the Navy and given 10-day leave before we had to go to our post. And one of the funny things that happened, and my mother used to talk about this for years afterwards, don't know why you did that. That was, that was not something you should have done. But anyway, there were about, I guess, 10 of them on my floor from Boston. And they got a real cohesive group, yeah. clannish. So many of them were Irish. What else comes from Boston, you know? So the Coast Guard said, what we're going to do is give you a choice of where you would like to go, because you were so good to do this to, for us. Can I just clarify mm -hmm. here? I think you said it earlier, Coast Guard to Navy, but you meant Navy, Navy to, Coast to Coast Guard. Navy to Coast Guard, okay. Yeah. So you're now in the Coast Guard. We're now Coast Guard personnel. Right. And they put uh, names of places where you could go, Boston, Washington, Washington State, New York, Florida, wherever. And then they put all of our names in another hat. And each one of us drew a place we would go and they said, um, oh, they didn't put our names in a hat. They just put the place that we were going to go. And I drew Boston. And the girl sitting beside me, I can't even remember her name, but I can see her as plain as if it happened yesterday. She burst into tears and she said, I want to go to Washington, D.C. I want to go to Boston. Who got Boston? Who got Boston? She's looking all around. And first, I didn't say anything because I. I didn't know whether I really wanted to go home or not. Well, for three days, that kid moaned and groaned and cried and carried on and called home. And she was getting to be a pain to everybody. And she was getting to be a nervous wreck. And I got really worried about her. So I went to her one day and I said, listen, I drew Boston. If you really want to go that badly, why don't you go down to the CO, tell her that you found somebody that is going to Boston and is willing to swap with you. Boy, it didn't take her two seconds to get down that office. <laughs> and they called me down and they said, is this true? And I said, yes, if she really wants to go. Doesn't make that much difference to me. So we swapped. She went home to Boston and I never heard from her again. So I don't know how she made out. And I went to Washington, D.C. 
So you're now going to Washington, D.C., having mm -hmm. gone from Little Natick to Corn Country, <laughs> Indiana, and... Um, now I'm on my way to Sin City. Really? Mm -hmm. And it, is that Gosh. the reputation that you saw or you heard oh, about? That's, that's what they all told us, you know. I suppose that we were young and what did we know? We were all young. I think the oldest one in my group was 32, and that was as old as you could be to get into the service. I liked her. I should have listened to her more. She was um, a know it, you know, she, she'd lived. I was 22, she was 32. She'd been married and was a widow. She had no children, so she thought this would be a great thing to do. And for her, I guess it was. When we came to Washington, D.C., to Coast Guard headquarters, and that building is no longer there, I can remember going down a few years ago to see the wall the Vietnam War. And I said I wanted to go over to Coast Guard headquarters. And when we tried to get over there, nobody knew what we were talking about. But you've got to remember that was 40 some years ago. So I had never been back. Couldn't get over the changes there. That was gone. All my barracks where we lived was gone. The hotel where we first stayed was gone. So nothing really was to go back for. And they have so many monuments in that city. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So you're in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and you're set up in the, eventually in barracks. Yes. When we first got there, they had nothing ready for us, so they built these temporary barracks behind the Smithsonian Institution, which was a great place to be. I spent a lot of time over at the Smithsonian. It was wonderful. And I spent every Sunday over at the Mellonac Gallery, which I loved. At one end of that gallery, if you've ever been there, or never been there, they had this gorgeous fountain. And I used to just sit there and think about home and... You were homesick? Oh, I was terrible. I was terribly homesick. How did you communicate with your family? Oh, I wrote all the time. My mother sent me things, articles from the bulletin and pictures and notes and... My aunt died, my, my young aunt, my mother's baby sister died uh, two months after I was in D.C. And she called me and I can remember her saying, don't try to come home because I know it's a big hassle and everything will be all over by the time you get here. So I never did come home for that. And I guess later I was sorry I didn't. She was only 27. And she died with an asthma attack. <clears throat> and since I was developing asthma, that made me a little nervous. But here I am, still here. But when I got there, I had been assigned to an office that at that time was working on blueprints for two Coast Guard cutters, the East Wind and the West Wind. Nothing to do with Storekeeper School at all. I didn't know beans when the bag was open, and I can remember being assigned to this one fellow who was supposed to show me what blueprints I was totally out of my element. I didn't know. I don't think any of us that were assigned to that office knew what we were going to do or what to do. Which I thought was kind of dumb after we've had four and a half months of training in one thing to put you into something totally incomprehensible to me. Ironically, a number of the um, other interviews that we've had with some of the men who were trained in specific areas found that once they same got overseas, thing. the same thing was happening, so... Yeah. Well, there were... Um, there was one gentleman there, Commander Steele, who was uh, commander of all of it. He gathered us all together one day, and he said, Now, I know some of you are very unhappy about your assignments, and I think that maybe we could do something about that if you'd like to talk to so-and-so over in this office. Of course, I was the first one in that office to say, Listen, I don't know anything about this. Give me something to do that I can do. Well, he said, um, have you ever done any recruiting? I said, no. I didn't ever have the chance. I just got out of storekeeper school out in Indiana. He said, why don't I send you over to the recruiting office and see if they could use you? So I went over there, and they said, gee, you know, we're having um, a little gathering tonight. You want to come and see what it's like and how you like it and 
what you could do with that? So I said, certainly. Anything would be better than sitting there looking at blueprints. So I went to that gathering, and while we were there, this fellow came in that was um, an, an MC at NBC in Washington, WRC, radio station. And he talked for a little while, and that was the night that we met Ellen oh. Roosevelt also. Was she at delightful, this gathering? Delightful, delightful woman. Yes, she came in and, and spoke to us and told us how proud she was of all of us and what a wonderful thing we were doing and how she wished she was a young girl again so that she could do this. She would have done it too. She was a fabulous person to talk to. And then she came around and shook hands with every single one of us that was there. And there must have been 45 or 50 of us there. And invited us all to tea at the White House. Some of us went and some of us didn't went. I didn't went <laughs> because <laughs> that night when we were leaving, uh, the man from WRC came over to me and he said, Bunny Chance, can you sing? And I don't recall what my answer to him was, but he said, tell you what, we're having auditions at WRC, why don't you come down? So we made a date to go down and I auditioned. And a couple of days later he called and he said, guess what, how would you like to be somebody named Mary the Spar? And I said, well, what would I do? And he said, uh, you would work with me in the morning from six to nine on WRC, we sing a little and we talk a little. And maybe you could interview some of the girls in service to find out how come they came and where they came from. I think you could do that? And I said, well, you know, it made me a little nervous to think I might be doing that. I said, well, I could try. If I don't work out, that's, at least I tried. And that's how I got to be on WRC every morning. And uh, he called Commander Steele and he said, I think we have a lady to represent the spars. So we had a big meeting in his office with public relations and all. And, and the PR man said, well, you know, there's only one thing. She's got a storekeeper badge and she can't be in PR with a storekeeper badge. And we haven't got that because we've never had this before. You've never had a PR person? Never female. had the, the um, a female, but they never had the category before. So he said, well, if you want to make your own, I'll give you a plain one. So I made my own. And that was the one I sat up all night and made. And PR for public relations. Public relations, yep. How long were you were involved with the WRC program in the morning? I was trying to think of that this morning. I think it was just a little over a year. It not only involved that, but we'd go to theaters, or we'd go to USOs, or we'd go to uh, different places, recruiting offices, and talk to people that might be interested in the service. Why do you think he chose you? I was pretty. I was uh, enthusiastic. I could sing. As a matter of fact, I don't think you remember. I don't think you were born when they dedicated this doorway out here for veterans of the First World War. Mm -hmm. And I sang with the Legion Band, the Star Spangled Banner, hardest song in the world to sing. And I was 18 years old. And it didn't bother me. My father was a nervous wreck. I could see him down at the bottom of the steps <laughs> because I hadn't rehearsed with the band. And uh, Tom Quinn, Judge Quinn, you, I don't think you would remember him. Maybe you would. They lived over in that beautiful big house next to the Legion headquarters. Uh, he had written me a lovely letter asking me if I would sing at the dedication. Of course, I was honored to do And this dedication, I'll, I'll add, is the dedication to our original front entrance yep. to this library, mm -hmm. which is now a museum piece. Yeah. It's a study room right next door to this yeah, room. Yeah, still mm -hmm. there. It's Beautiful. very, very pretty. Yes. Yeah. So I did that. So I guess that's why. Um, they sent me over to Underwood and Underwood to have my pictures taken. And while I was there, I met the lady who ran that, Mrs. Rubin. And she said, Mary, if you ever decide to leave the service and you're looking for a job, come and see me. And you know I did that? 
I went to see her as soon as I was discharged. Even though I knew I wanted to come home, I wasn't sure when I would. And I worked for her for seven months. I had a wonderful time. But then I had a wonderful opportunity to go to work at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, and that's what I did. This was after the service. Now, yeah. after a year with the radio station, is that when you were discharged? That was or? when the war was winding down, mm -hmm. I think, because that was the last job I had in service. So it had to be just when they were thinking, because I can remember uh, him picking me up one morning for rehearsal, saying there's no need to rehearse anymore because the program will be over because things are happening really fast over in Europe. Yeah. And uh, we won't be recruiting much anymore. So that was the end of my Mary the Spar days. <laughs> when you interviewed some of these, mostly women, I assume? Yeah, all women. All women. Mm -hmm. Does any particular story stand out in your mind? No, I think they all had about the same feeling. Well, it was something to do, it was something exciting, it was something new to get into the beginning and be able to say when you, long after the war was over, oh, I helped with the war effort. That's what a lot of them said. Were you also um, educated by a certain group to say or do certain things or not oh, say? Oh, yes. You, you had to be very careful of what you said. I would have to write out every day what we were going to discuss the following day. And uh, a couple of times I slipped up on that and um, I, I really heard about it. <laughs> but nothing detrimental. Um, I remember one time we were supposed to have an orchestra that couldn't come and I think I said something like, oh, they can't come so we have to be satisfied with so and so, which was not a nice thing to say, but I didn't mean it that way, but that's the way they took it. So true and public so, relations. Yeah. Mm. They took it right to the top and I got called on the carpet. And rightly so. And why didn't I give them that? I just forgot about it, I guess. I don't remember. So how did you get the opportunity to work for the UN? Um, I had met a uh, gentleman who was in charge of the UN Library, uh, Mr. Jensen from Norway. All oh, the accents that I ran into, I had a wonderful time because I love to mimic. Uh, I had met him at one of the embassy parties and he was talking about um, needing people that he, American girls, he wanted to train and asked me what I was doing and I said I was working at Underwood and Underwood photographers. What was I doing? Selling photographs. Did I like it? Well, it was all right, but, you know, it was nothing I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So he said, How, why don't you come over and we'll talk at the uh, FAO headquarters. So I did, and I loved everybody I met. I had a wonderful time. I met Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, English, uh, Chinese. Oh, I loved the Chinese people that worked there. They're so intelligent and they were so funny. I had a wonderful time with them. And I, w I went to work there in the library at the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. And really all I did was, um, when I look back on it now, I don't know how they kept me as long as I did. <laughs> I just put numbers in books and checked off when they came in. and. But that wasn't as interesting to me as meeting all the different people from all over the world. So it was a real cultural exchange oh, for you. Oh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah. I, had, I was wishing that I could speak French or Spanish or Italian. And speaking of Italian, FAO was moving to Italy. They went to Rome. And at that time, I was dating. And uh, the fellow I was dating said, well, I'm not going to go to Rome. I said, come on, be a wonderful experience. No, I'm not going to go, and I don't want you to go. And at the, that time, I listened. Now I'd tell him to drop dead, and I'd go. <laughs> but those days, <laughs> I don't know. I guess women just didn't do those things. So I stayed, and I got married, and was sorry. Bad mistake. Big mistake. But anyway, FAO departed. 
to Rome, and uh, I still kept in touch with a lot of people that I had met there, and I loved the years that I spent. I spent three years there. And have you had many reunions since then? I haven't been to but one reunion from my Coast Guard days. I don't go to any of the others. First of all, they're too far away from where I live. Second, they're too darn expensive to get to. And third, I'm not a joiner. I'm not a, oh, i slap you on the back. Gee, I'm happy to see you after all this time. Actually, you know, when I was in the Coast Guard, I didn't make very many friends. I used to have to get up at 5.30 in the morning, every morning but Saturday and Sunday, to go down to the studio. And transportation didn't start until 6 a.m. in those days. So I walked from the barracks where I lived all the way down to the station, which was a good two miles every morning. And you did your morning show. Mm -hmm. What happened then after the show was over? What was a typical day like for you? What did I do? I had rehearsal three days a week, three afternoons a week. Um, I don't know what I did the other time. Maybe I was just on my own. And then Probably. weekends? Weekends I used to love to go exploring. I go to Mount Vernon, which was magnificent. And they have beautiful cathedrals in Washington, D.C. I think I went to every one of them. They were really lovely. I spent a lot of time at the Art Gallery. I spent a lot of time at the Smithsonian, which I thought was just wonderful. And I did a lot of walking around. Did any other members of your family go into the service? Not my, not my sisters, my brother, no. My brother uh, eventually went into the National Guard for five years, but he didn't go into service. Did your family consider you a bit unique to <laughs> have done this? I think so. I think my dad was really thrilled that I was in, because I helped him a lot uh, when I came back. I didn't stay very long when I came back, but he ran the Beano games over at Bedford Hospital for the veterans, and my mother was in the auxiliary, and she used to help also. So I did that. Oh, I think that's where I said, if I live through this. I will never play bingo one more time in my life. Did I hate that game? Oh, because the guys played for bubble gum and beach gum and cigarettes and stuff like that. What do you think, looking back on your experiences, what, what were some of your most memorable experiences? Well, I think the most memorable was uh, seeing Eisenhower when he came back from the European theater. Um, I remember standing on the corner when he rode by, and he went by so fast, it was a total blur. I was hoping he would just take his time, but you know how those people are. They just raced him by, but it was nice to see him anyway. And then meeting Eleanor Roosevelt was a big deal, too, because she was such a love, just a wonderful, wonderful lady. And what else did I do? I can't think of anything outstanding. So once, once you finished up with your service and you finished up with the UN, did you come back to Natick at that point? No, I got married and moved to Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Worked at the Enu Pratt Free Library. And did you have any children? I had a daughter who died. Mm -hmm. And that marriage broke up and I came home at that point in time. And I stayed home for a long time. I worked at the Boston Lying in Hospital, and Parker Hill Medical Center, and then I decided why didn't I go into nursing, which is what I really wanted to do in the beginning. So I took a course in uh, nurse assistant over at the Middlesex County Hospital, and I took uh, <laughs> oh. I took a test for LPN, and I had been out of school for so long. I hadn't taken biology or chemistry or anything that would have helped me pass that exam. So that was a big bust. So then I took another course in um, nurse assistant and home health care. And I loved that. And I still do that. And I have since taken a respite care course. And I do that care also. And I like that very much. So at the age of 77, you're still staying very busy. 
I hardly have time to change the sheets on my bed. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way you've got to be when you retire. I retired from uh, public housing, where I worked in Wellesley for 26 years. Mm -hmm. I lived in Wellesley 26 years. I worked for the Wellesley Housing Authority for 14 and retired from there gratefully and came back home to Natick to Natick to find a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. Some good, some not so good. Mm -hmm. But they call it progress, so I guess I have to go along with that. I'm glad to be back. I'm very active in a lot of things that are going on around town. Such as? Such as we're trying to save our old high school from which I graduated. Uh, I don't know that we are going to do that. I've joined the Performing Arts Center as a volunteer. I'm an ombudsman for the state of Massachusetts as a volunteer. I do hospice care as a volunteer for the Council on Aging. And I babysit for a lovely family that I've been with for 11 years. So you see, I, I don't really have much time. When I do, I read. I know you are a, a wonderful library <laughs> friend. I love the library. I love the new library. It's beautiful. One of the questions we've asked a number of people that have been involved in some form of service throughout the different wars is how you feel about the difference of public opinion regarding veterans from World War II, the Korean conflict, and the Vietnam War. Of course, when the boys came back from World War II, it was hooray. Aren't you wonderful? You did such a magnificent job. Korea, I don't remember them doing anything for those poor guys. And Vietnam, I can remember my nephews, both of them turned 18 over in Vietnam. My sister Jean's boys, Jim and Dan. They came back with horror stories, both of them. Shattered a little bit emotionally. And I think Dan is the one that went down to Washington, D.C. with a group of Vietnam vets and threw his medals over the White House spent Oh, gosh. They really were not treated the way they should have been when they came back. That was a very sad thing. And it bothers me that there is a faction that wants women in combat. It was bad enough to be in service without being in combat. I think that's obscene. I don't know how any woman can want to do that. But I do think it's a wonderful experience. I think every able-bodied person, women included, should spend some time in the service of their country. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful, beautiful country we have. And we should all be deeply grateful for what we have. My son and I drove across to California two years ago. And I was just thrilled with being able to do that. It was wonderful. The freedom to do that. The freedom and to see every state that we went through, how different they are, and how friendly people can be. It was really, it was really an, a wonderful experience. Looking back on your careers, how do you feel the military helped you? Um, or how do you feel it affected your life? Oh, I don't know that it helped me at all. Helped me? I don't know. Um, I was such a little country girl when I went in. I'm, I'm afraid that I was a little intolerant of other people's opinions and ideas and whatever. Um, Did that change? Oh, I hope so. Um, <laughs> I still get very impatient when things don't go the way they, I think they should go. But I hope that I'm better than I was when I was 22, and 25, and 30, I don't know. I think uh, you have to live a long time to learn what you learn at 70. Mm -hmm. And keep learning. You do keep learning every day, I think. Is there anything else you want to leave us with? This has been a wonderful interview. <laughs> Thank you. I hope we don't have any more wars that we have to put up with and tolerate. I just, I don't understand. I wish women ran the world. And I do believe if we did, there would be no such thing as war.
private wars maybe with a difference of opinion, but killing each other's children, horrible thought. War is terrible. I think it was Sherman who said war is hell, and he was right. Mm -hmm. Mary, we'd like to thank you for coming in today. We My really pleasure. appreciate your open candor. Thank you. Thank you.